Okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the session. Latecomers, please join. My name is Igor Jubuncic. Uh, I'm a developer advocate at Canonical. And today I want to talk to you about an interesting, possibly even contentious topic, the Firefox Snap startup performance. But more importantly, this is going to be an adventure. I'm going to take you from a state of a problem to an amazing solution. Now, before we begin, I have here the finest of little chocolate that I managed to buy in the local supermarket. And the rules are as follows. If you ask me questions and or answer my questions and or provide a witty remark, you will get a chocolate. Now that we've established that, let's see what happens when I click the next slide. It's a bit about myself. Uh, like I said, I'm a developer advocate. I've been doing Linux for the last 20 years, more or less. Uh, I write books, and I also like to drive fast cars in a safe manner around racetracks. Now, let's talk about the Snap. So it was released, Firefox is a Snap, alongside Ubuntu 21.10. And we didn't really get much feedback about it. The audience, I mean, the user, it was kind of mellow, quiet. Then, another release happened, the LTS, 2204. And then, we do get a lot of feedback. And the feedback wasn't good. It was focused mostly around the start of performance. There were a few other issues, but mostly people didn't like the slow startup. It was perceived as not good enough as the deb. It was perceived as not good enough, period. So what's the conclusion here then, based on just these two little slides, 2110, 2204? What's the conclusion? A chance to win the first chocolate. More people use the LTS. More people use the LTS, it's a good one. Anyone else? Yes? Say again, and lo more loudly please. Firefox is default in the LTS. Firefox is default in the LTS. I mean, we'll get a chocolate for participation, <laughs> but the basic, Answer, there are two. Yo, yo, one more chocolate. Yes, please. Yes, it's a good one. When you have your early testers, when you have beta testers, when you have your early adopters, they're more sympathetic to your cause. While they do discover problems, they are actually blind to what the normal users will see when you go to, to production. So, as a famous general of the past said, no plan survives contact with the user. Right, so let's rectify the problem. What do we do now, right? At this point, we have two options as a company. We can ignore the feedback, or we can do something radical and say, let's check everything. I mean, we did have a very good understanding of what we thought the problem was, but there's a difference between an assumption and a scientifically, methodically proven and tested resolution. And we decided to go for the second. Even though it was way more work for us, even though it meant s doubting and self-checking, which is never kind of a good thing, it eventually led to some amazing results. So, first we need to talk about results, numbers. What I'm presenting here in this table are actual seconds, but ignore the fact that we're looking at seconds. What you should, should look at is a ratio between different results for different distributions. And all these are also hardware dependent. If you take a laptop from 10 years ago with a mechanical disk, these are not the numbers you will have, but they will follow the similar ratio. You will maybe have 50 and 22 and then 48 or some other number, but the ratio will be more or less the same. So this set of numbers represents a particular hardware platform. I'm purposefully not telling you which one it is, and I'm purposefully not doing averages because in averages, you lose the full meaning of a potential problem. So what we had here was, okay, Let's launch Firefox, the very first launch. We get some numbers. Then again, we do a second launch and we get some numbers. And in both cases, we're talking a cold start. And the definition of a cold start is nothing is cached in memory. So we have to read everything from the disk and load into memory. That operation is slower than what we call a warm or hot launch when you have everything in your memory so it's immediately accessible. And what we see here is that for some reason, the Ubuntu and OpenSUSE results were worse than the Fedora results. Interesting, right? So what's the main difference, let's say, between Ubuntu and Fedora? Kernel. Kernel. 
Yes, but not major difference. I don't think you can get a chocolate for that any, that's, a, that's too obvious. Yes, please. App Armor SC Linux, so I'm gonna toss the chocolate gently so I don't hit the camera. Yes, Ubuntu uses App Armor, Fedora uses SC Linux, which that means, let's see what happens behind the scenes. Now I'm going to show you a little bit of technical information of different measurements we did to try to understand the ecosystem a little bit better. Here you have uh, an output of a summary of an S-Trace run. For those of you who don't know what S-Trace is, it's a tracing tool that allows you to capture the system calls that are being executed as part of a runtime of a program. That is done by hooking into the ptrace functionality in the kernel, and you basically duplicate every system call twice. One for the actual execution, and the second one for, uh, excuse me, sorry, can you close the door please? Thank you. Uh, and the second one to output. So here we have a summary, and the summary shows a lot of system calls being done a lot of errors and a very long time for execution for each system call. Now, you do need to compare to uh, a non-affected system, you need to compare it to different systems. I'm just giving you an indication that we saw that there's a lot of computation being done. For some reason, there's a lot of work behind the scenes. It kind of makes sense because that affects the launch time, but why? Now, here's a comparison of numbers. So for instance, a Futex system call, or a write system call, or a poll system call, for the confined snap, you get tens of thousands of calls. For the unconfined snap, which means it's still a Firefox as a snap, but not confined, you get way less, three to four times less. So this is another indicator that we potentially may have something with the security confinement, okay. Let's check the security confinement, right? No, not really. So what we did, we disabled App Armor. We allow a permissive profile, everything works. Did that change the runtime? The answer is no. We used a, what's called an unrestricted sec, seccom profile. You can actually create a profile that has the following text in there, unrestricted uh, backslash n new line, right? And that means there's no filtering. So we exclude seccomp from the equation as well. And the answer is still no difference. You can then unpack the snap and run it without the mount namespace that is done with a C group to see whether there's something weird there. And the answer is no. So it's not a security. So we talk about SC Linux, we talk about App Armor. It's a good starting point, but apparently not a cause. What else? Okay, because this question is a bit difficult. Two chocolates. Yes, please. Squash effect. Okay, okay. I mean, I'll give you one because it's a short answer. Um, we'll get there. We'll get. You can't you can't win all the chocolates, right? So. What about compression? As you probably know, or not, but snaps are compressed file system, squash FS file system. So the question is then, is there something wrong with the compression there? Now, about a year ago, two years ago, we did a lot of studies on the effect of compression on startup time. And we discovered that yes, if you use a less um, compressive compression algorithm, you need less computation to unpack the snap, and you get faster startup time. So we switched from the default XZ algorithm to the LZ01. What it resulted in is a 50% increase in size and two thirds decrease in startup time. The reason why XZ was used was because it was the most supported algorithm across distributions and across kernels. But more recently, as more kernels and distros adopted LZO as well, we, we decided that we should extend the usage of the LZO compression algorithm for various snaps, including Firefox. And lo and behold, but Firefox is already using LZO. Uh -huh. So what's happening? So it's, is it compression? Is it something else? No. 
you got your chocolates, so you'll have to wait. <laughs> you have to try harder for, for, so the more chocolates you win, the harder your future answers have to be. That also applies to you as well. <laughs> so what about content snaps? Again, a concept that I need to introduce. In order to save space and make development easier, we bundle common or reused components into something called content snaps. I'll give you an example from the KD world. KD have about 110, 120 snaps in the store. It would be a waste of time to package every single library that every KD application needs into 100 plus copies of it every time. So that they bundle all of their commonly used KD uh, libraries into content snaps, and every KD snap uses those. And that's true also for, for GNOME. We also have GNOME platform snaps. What about those? They were not compressed with LZO. They were compressed with XZ. This is what happens though for GNOME 338 2004 when we compress it with LZO. This is how the startup times change. So we are already seeing an improvement, a significant improvement, especially on the second cold launch. Ignore the first one. But in the second one, we improved the situation by 65, 66%. We're down to one third than what we had. It's a good start. Now my question is, why is the first launch still slow? Now, again, I'm gonna raise the stakes of participation and engagement. Two chocolates to the highest bidder. Come on, have a little guess. Why would the very first launch be slower? Yes, please. Updates, I mean, you need a chocolate because that's how I declared the rules of engagement, but that's not the correct answer. I mean, it, it's a good effort. Yes, please, on the back. Initial configs. Now you have to show dexterity and catch two chocolates flying at the same time. Oh, it's going, it's going. If you're not ready, it's your problem. So, this was my question, and the answer is, Initial configuration, we have to set up the profile, but we also set up all of the language packs. And for most users, this is irrelevant because most people use one, maybe two languages, but pretty much everyone uses a single language for their interface. So we made a change where we don't bundle all of the language packs into the snap. And that shaved off the startup times by a good few more seconds, more numbers. Now we have the first and the second launch pretty much identical. Can we improve even more? What do you think? Yes. Switch to Chrome. <laughs> okay, so here's, here's a provocative way of asking questions, which is fine, and me as a, a, I, and I as a presenter have to be able to deal with it. Switch to Fedora, how would that help? Because you see, changes that are positive across the board. Um, Fedora seems to be better for uh, the second cold launch. Yes, for now. But how can we optimize for all the other distributions? We have 40 plus supported distributions. We want all of them to enjoy the benefits. You can't ask people to switch to distro. What we can do is make things even better. How do we do that? We place up Armour with SC Linux, but we saw that the security isn't, the confinement doesn't make a difference. Yes, please. RAM disks? You know what? You're on a roll. You're getting another chocolate. Are you, I mean, the answer is not 100% correct, but the thinking is along the same lines. So, what this slide says let's preload everything before launch. We created a proof of concept where you have a startup service that preloads all the libraries that Firefox would need so that then the numbers look like this. Yes, physics mandate conservation of energy, so you can't really get something out of nothing, but if you preload everything, let's say at the startup of the, of the desktop session, then the next time you want to launch your browser, it's pretty much like a hot start. Everything is preloaded, so you're doing a controlled one-time 
cache warming, if you will. Now we're down to two seconds. Yes, please. This is not specific to Firefox. We did it as a proof of concept for Firefox, but this is true for every single snap in the world in case we an or anyone wants to implement it. Uh, would each snap need to implement it itself? The idea is no, but hold your horses. Let's see what happens. Now, back to the provocative question, Fedora and Ubuntu. Why is there the difference? Who mentioned Squash FS earlier? Ow. Ow, chocolate your way. So, there was a difference between how Squash FS is implemented in the kernel, in Fedora, and Ubuntu. As it turns out, and there's a reason for it, Ubuntu had a single threaded decompression. Fedora, multi-threaded. Let's change it. This is Ubuntu using XO, Squash FS Multi. We, uh, we improve 66% just by changing the Squash FS decompression, even without the change of the algorithm itself. So we now get Fedora level results by changing the configuration to match the Fedoras in terms of the kernel Squash FS. So Let's exclude the language stuff because that's a one-time thing that has to happen, right? The profile setup for the first user ever. But even if we use the old algorithm, which is more CPU intensive, we still gain 66% improvement on average, especially for this platform, than what we had before. Now, we use Elzado, we get even more improvement. Now, we're at the point where diminishing uh, diminishing levels of uh, re uh, return, right? You can't now get another 66%, another 66%, but still, we shave another 20% just by combining the two. Let's look at the final result. What do we have here? We take a Firefox star, a tarball, like Mozilla provide Firefox as a tarball on their site. Download it, extract it, use it. No restriction, no uh, limitation. Take the snap. But the Squash FS configuration is multi-threaded. We use LZO, and the results are identical. We match the Firefox snap performance with the non-snap implementation, which is something the users always wanted, and which is the root cause of the uh, complaints and feedback that we got when we did this. As you can see, it's a nice little Sherlock Holmes story. We start with some with a little problem, and then we narrow down, and we follow a false path at first, because you can't have a good story without a twist. And then we go back to uh, the great result. Come in, come in. Chocolate for the participants and those who ask questions. Now, what's the lesson that we learned in this whole investigation? And I would like to ask you again for your feedback. Chocolate's forthcoming. What's the lesson that we learned here? What's the big one? Never give up, never surrender. That's what you see, that's not really, con that doesn't contribute to the subject matter, but it's funny. <laughs> yes, please. Test the software in more than one environment. Test the software in more than one environment. That's a good one. Unfortunately, in this case, Canonical or Ubuntu doesn't control how other distributions deliver their software. So S Firefox Snap as a default isn't necessarily likely to be part of the non-Ubuntu ecosystem, which, let's say, Arch, Manjaro, Fedora, CentOS, wouldn't necessarily do. So if they don't do it, it is a little bit hard to create identical first-time user experience that we encountered in Ubuntu. It would be great if we could match it, and we can do synthetic tests, but like I mentioned in slide number six, no plan survives first contact with a user. Come in, Till. This is the best session of the conference. <laughs> S second best, sorry, okay. What? <laughs> yeah, okay. But main lessons here is, first, no hubris. We didn't try to think that we we're the best of the best and there's nothing to learn here and nothing for us to do. We did the opposite. We tested everything, we doubted everything, and we introduced significant changes along the way. 
Can I say that we also improved our own understanding of our own system? To an extent, yes, and it's a good feeling. The more control you have in the process, the better the results will be for everyone. Now, that said, we also learned that on a purely technical level, regardless of everything else, the choice of the algorithm and the squash of SD compression account for the major part of the experience across the board. And the most important conclusion is that we were able to match the performance of the SNAP with non-SNAP implementation. And that's what the users care about. Now this change, this change, this change, affects everyone and everything. We introduced more uh, solutions and more fixes along the way. Because when we started this thing, we began checking everything. One of the things that was problematic was the use of certain extensions. Like let's say um, in KDE, you can have the plasma integration. Basically in Firefox, you install an extension and that means that you can also control say YouTube videos through your plasma system tray, right? That didn't work in the beginning with a Firefox snap. Any extension that needed local disk access and a bit more permissive work, if you will, couldn't function correctly. That was fixed. So that's no longer an issue. There are still some things that need to be implemented, like smart card readers and a, a few others, but we're slowly getting there. We're improving more and more. On the Raspberry Pi, we discovered that, uh, well, it was kind of known, but we properly, methodically uh, analyzed it. Firefox uh, was using software rendering. So that's fixed as well. Uh, and all of these changes actually now can be implemented in every single snap. So that means that first any distro or any kernel that uses multi-threaded uh, decompression, you gain. LZO, you gain. What we implement as owners of part of the ecosystem automatically affects everyone. So any snap that uses the GNOME platform snap or snaps, because there are multiple ones, and since they're they com now compressed as LZO, means every other snap, not just Firefox, Thunderbird, Chromium, and all the others, they also gain from exactly the same kind of benefits that Firefox does. Not bad. Now, here's a question that no one asked. Why were we using a single threaded decompression in the Ubuntu kernel? to begin with, right? Let me ask you then the question, why? Legacy from 2005. Legacy from 2005. That's a good start of an answer, it's incomplete, but a chocolate is... No, 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 you, you got your chocolate, you got your chocolate. We need to, um, yes please. It was buggy at some point. It was not used, and then? The behavior was checked with that, and now it's probably not buggy, it's better. And, and it's now probably not buggy and it's better. That's the correct answer. There was a problem with the multi-threaded SquashFS decompression in some of the older kernels, I think in 1804, and that affected some enterprise solutions and workflows. Now, in the enterprise space, you need top-notch stability, top-notch compatibility. So the kernel couldn't afford to have a buggy implementation. Fortunately, unfortunately, the way it is in the Linux world, a huge number of enterprise solutions and implementations propagate into the, into the desktop space. And this is true across the board. This is not Ubuntu specific in any way. This is SUSE, this is Red Hat, all the distros, right? These solutions were great in the enterprise space. They might not necessarily always be the best choice for the end user on the desktop. The problem was fixed. The bugginess, as you said, was removed. And we were able to reintroduce multi-threaded decompression as part of the mainline, uh, sorry, not mainline, but standard default Ubuntu kernel. So now, it's not even a question of a one-time test change Fedora Ubuntu. It's something going forward, which again, all of the users of Ubuntu will benefit from. Yes, please.
No, they fixed it on purpose. We provided them feedback. I mean, like, after what they have seen the product, what yes. the product is? Yes. Do you know why the production cars didn't have the problem? Like no, they, they, they did. They, they were perfectly cognizant of the shit. So the question was why the kernel team didn't know or didn't spot the change and reintroduce it. Because you don't make random changes that could affect enterprise customers without a really, really important reason. So even if there was a bug, and you change something for the sake of fixing the bug, and now the bug is resolved, you don't just randomly go back. Because all your customers and workflows may rely on a change you made. So it has to be introduced in a very slowly controlled manner with lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of testing. Right? So the changes can be made quickly in the desktop space, but if your ecosystem is much wider than that, you have to be a little bit more careful. Sometimes that may give a perception of, oh, you're kind of dallying, you're not thinking about the end user, but the end user is a huge portion of people who need to be satisfied end to end. And no one has mercy or uh, patience for anything, right? How big are the uh, changes like that? Uh, changes are occasionally introduced, but they have to be done in a very careful manner because small things can have a lot of, lot of effect. Any other questions? Yes, please. The question is, is the desktop team looking at, are there any enterprise level things in the distro that might need changing for the desktop users? It's a very different, yes, but the, answer, the, the, the change itself is very difficult. The more variation you introduce into your ecosystem, the more chance for problems and, and, and uh, misconfigurations. Because let's say something doesn't work in a configuration A17.5, but it works in A17.9, then who is affected, why? In one way, the more commonality you have, the better you control the system, the more likely you are to have stability and quality. On the other hand, it's more difficult to create a generic workflow that works for everything. And it's always going to be a trade-off. Does that mean you identify things and are not going to act on it? Or as, as, <laughs> as a former US President Nixon once said, I can neither confirm nor deny that rumor. <laughs> so any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, so the first question, who's maintaining the Firefox app? It's the Mozilla team, if I'm not, no. mista if I'm not mistaken, yeah? Yeah, Mozilla team, yeah, it's theirs. And are, are we going to switch to Wayland? Switch what to Wayland? Firefox. Firefox. <laughs> Firefox is an application, and it will run on whatever the desktop, what? Why did my slide disappear? Possibly. Possibly. Okay, the slides disappeared, but there are no more slides. I was just going to say after the questions, thank you for your participation, party on and all that. But we still have more questions, so please do continue asking. So what I was saying is, if you have your X or Wayland, Firefox will run on both. It's how you set up your desktop or how your distro by default sets up your desktop. But you do get, one second, I need to give the person their chocolate and then, you don't want the chocolate? You can nominate someone who will get your chocolate. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. So the question is whether Firefox runs in the pure Wayland or X Wayland mode. I honestly don't have an answer to that, but we can follow up. It doesn't matter up to who the question that is. I don't, unfortunately, have the answer for you. We can follow up after the session. Chocolate? Sure. Yes. Yes, please. Okay. So I would think that Jason Max is now um, running in parallel. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why, even though it's doing more, mm -hmm. are still going to the same, is because modern is going to use a web store, are still good, that they can do all these extra calculations and still have the same. Yes. So, but then on the website, sure. 
So ju let me just repeat the question for because I have the microphone. I'm not sure if your questions can be heard on the live stream. Uh, what about the Pi? Do we see the same kind of optimizations on the Pi and the fact that the Pi processor may be bottleneck on CPU operations as opposed to the desktop one, which can afford to do the multi-threading and, and mo more work? So the answer is yes. We also managed to get nice improvements on the Pi as well. They might not be as amazing as the desktop, but again, benefits across the board. Yes, please. Energy consumption? From the physics perspective, you will use pretty much the same level of energy. Because if you decompress using one core over 15 seconds or three cores over five seconds, assuming that your CPU manages heat dissipation in an efficient way, which they do, you will at the end use the same wattage, same amount of energy at the end of it. Physics doesn't allow you shortcuts. In some way, the energy will be used as much as it needs to be used. You can save energy by making a more efficient operating system or a more efficient browser, maybe, but you will not save energy by taking one task that is done serially to putting it into a few shorter tasks done in parallel. Chocolate, nominate your winner. Okay, there you go. Okay, any more questions? I mean, I have chocolate, I can scatter them across the room randomly and that's a solution or you can ask more questions. Let's have one more for, uh, yes, please. So are, are there any, I, I missed the beginning of the first sure. The question is, has there been anything we did that is Firefox specific and or will not be ported to other SMES? Technically, not really. This benefits the entire ecosystem, but if you don't, let's say, use the GNOME platform snap or the KDE platform snap, you might not get the benefits if you bundle all your libraries in your snap and you package the snap as XZ. On the other hand, your snap may actually be really small because it does need these extra libraries, so it will have a fast startup time anyway, but there's really nothing that is Firefox specific. Firefox is a great, great flagship example of how we fix the problem, but the, f the problem now is pretty much solved for thousands of snaps. Chocolate. Yes, please. The question is, what about if the content snap is loaded into the cache? Has, does that affect the loading of the uh, snap? Like say Firefox, let's say the GNOME um, snap platform snap was loaded in memory and we're now launching Firefox. The answer is yes, it, you would get the benefits, but it's hard to predict the conditions and the scenario where that would be the case. Because it is possible that a system component may use a GNOME platform snap and load first, but it's possible that your browser uses a slightly different version of still the GNOME snap, but slightly different version, and then you don't necessarily see the benefits. So you need to be more deterministic in that sense, and then you can't say, okay, I cannot bet on someone using this set of conditions, then you improve all the conditions, and then you no, don't need to worry about a very particular use case. Yes, please. Have we tested other popular Snap? The answer is absolutely yes. We tested Thunderbird, we tested Chromium. Exactly the same improvements. The times are slightly different. Thunderbird is a bit slower than Firefox. Chromium is a bit faster than Firefox, but the exact same patterns, the exact same percentage of improvements. Beautiful, of course. Yes, yes please. What, okay, it's a good question. What about no compression? Z let's say LZO and no compression. Tiny benefits, tiny, tiny benefits. At this point, you gain more by having slightly more compressed content than using no algorithm at all. Th it's all about diminishing returns, but it's a good question. That's why you get a chocolate. Yes, please, yes. The, the preloading, is that something that will happen or was it just dependent on everything? Will preloading happen? That's the question. The answer is we didn't necessarily plan of introducing it as a thing, as a service. It was more to test to see what it does. 
we basically were able to get pretty much the same benefits with just LZO and multi-threaded decompression. So that's, let's call it a, a doomsday weapon if we ever need to use it. Yes, please. Yes. Sorry, can you speak a little bit louder so I can hear you? You're asking whether a library is preloaded before the application actually needs it. No, well, if the application doesn't need to be loaded, the app, if the library needs to be loaded, how does Snap load it from the base or not? Snaps, uh, so the question is, are libraries loaded, let's call it blindly, without relying on the dynamic dependency loading of an application? Yes. Snap is uh, packaged content. Snap doesn't do any logic on its own. SnapD, basically what it does is gateway security, the, the namespace, and then hands off to the application inside the snapped environment with its own environment variables. At that point, the application does exactly what any Linux application does, however it's coded. If it's uh, an ELF format, uh, shared, uh, shared binary with shared dependencies, it will load them however it's supposed to load and it will parse its header and just load libraries and look for them in the path that is predefined and so forth. So there's nothing here that Snap alters in, in, in the sense of how Linux works. It may change the paths where you look for the libraries, but the libraries will be loaded by Firefox how it needs them, by how Firefox needs them, regardless of the Snap. The ceiling got in the way. I'll try again. Yes, please. Actually, let's make that a last question. You get two chocolates because I run out of chocolates. Yes, please. So does that mean that you get decompressed when the snap starts? Or do dynamic libraries get decompressed when the application is decompressed? The question is when is the decompression done? The decompression is done when the snap is basically unpacked. So it's a one time thing. Two chocolates. I'd like to thank you for your time and joining me for this little investigative Sherlock Holmes journey. Hope you enjoy this. If you have any other questions, you can reach out outside. Uh, Telegram, however you like. Hope you had fun. This was informative. Party on. <laughs>